everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Preserving Hellenism podcast with AF Foundation. I'm Ari, and with me are my two co-hosts, and we have a super special guest today. But first, let me introduce uh, my first co-host, Foti Stamos. How are you, Foti? Good in yourself, Ari. Very good, very good. We're excited about today, and I'm always excited when Rula's with us. Hey, Rula. Hello, Kalimera, everybody. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I am very good. So, um, uh, Rula, I'm going to hand it over to you to bring on this very special guest we have today. So tell us a little I, bit about him. I am very excited today. We have with us Father Theodore Parasquevopoulos, who is up here in the greater Toronto area with me. Uh, Father Ted, if we can, as we he is uh, mostly called by uh, mm-hmm. his parishioners and those who know and love him, is a distinguished priest up here in the GTA. Um, his uh, biography speaks for itself, and I will let him do mm-hmm. himself justice. Um, but Father Ted, you may also know that face because Father Ted has done a little bit of acting, right, Father Ted, as well? You have not? I you have. Are lying, lying. <laughs> uh, you may have seen him in My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Um, he has some other, my, yes, My Big Fat Greek Wedding too. Um, and he is also just an all around great individual, great guy. And I am honored uh, to be able to, to call him a, a friend and spiritual uh, leader. So Father Ted, want to tell us a little bit about your uh your church community and who you are and who you uh, help serve. Okay, well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Kalimera, um, Kalimera. to everybody in the podcast. Hey. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, doing intros for yourself kind of seems self-serving, but I'll try and be really quick. Um, so, yeah, my name is Father Ted. Um, I am a priest here in Toronto. I'm born and raised in Toronto, Canada. Uh, I've been serving for as a priest for about 15 years now, believe it or not. Um, so I served both... Um, in Winnipeg, which is central Canada, for the for the Americans, that's just north of North Dakota, so like in the prairies, cold. Um, so I was there for about six years, and then I came back to Toronto, and I served at St. Constant and Helen, which is actually the closest church to my current church. I served there for eight and a half years, and now I am currently at Prophet Elias Greek Orthodox Church in Mississauga, which is just outside. It's close, but it's just outside of Toronto. So I've been here for about eight months now, and uh, yeah, so that's my, as far as priesthood goes. And uh, in addition to that, uh, I have a pretty extensive background in both youth ministry, uh, having helped start um, the program, uh, Camp Metamorphosis, which is like the, the summer camps program we have in Canada. I helped start that back in 98, so a long time ago. And now we have um, Camp Mets, as we affectionately call them, across the country now. We have in Toronto, we have in Montreal, we have in Halifax, we have in Winnipeg, we have in Vancouver. Um, and that has a, a strong, not only religious element, but a Greek element to it. So, you know, Greek culture and things like that. And of course, the other thing that I do that I'm, I'm, I'm heavily involved in as far as the Greek side is that I own, I co-own and co-founded a professional Greek dance company called Paradosi Hellenic Dance Company, um, which is um, strictly a traditional dance company, which I, what I mean by that is that we, um, we focus on um, traditional dancing, uh, village traditions, singing, instrumentation, like more part of the Shaka as opposed to modern dancing mm-hmm. and things like that uh and we've had that for this is actually our 20th year so um and of course we have junior programs all the way from four years old all the way up to the adult professional company which is la- which has been around for 20 years so i teach in that as well with my other co-founders so that's kind of a nutshell i don't know what else you need but that's pretty much it so so for a, for a podcast called preserving hellenism i think we hit the jackpot <laughs> with this guest right here i mean that's amazing that that i mean how i i I'm going to say this, but I don't know how you could answer it, but how do you have time for all of these things? And, and I, I, I think you, you're, you also have a family yourself. Yes. Yes. So I'm married. I have three children. Oh. I have twins, a boy and a girl who are 11. Oh, actually in January, they'll be 12, Georgia Katerina. And then I have another boy who's eight, Angelo. So yeah, you, it's, you, you squeeze it's, all this in. Well, you know, you, you, um, when you're young, when you're a young priest, you um, you throw yourself into your work and you don't have very good time management. But as you get older, you learn how to step back a bit. And uh, even though you may be involved with different things, you learn how to be assertive and um, and, you know, work smart as opposed to working hard all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, you learn how to delegate and uh, trust the people around you and, and, and you make, you know, I find that it sounds like a lot, but I used to do a lot more, believe it or not. And now mm-hmm. I kind of pulled back and I just do. Um, I do uh, fewer things, but better. So I focus like on the church. Of course, that's the church as a whole 
Yeah. It's a massive thing, uh, which has many moving parts, especially this community, because it's one of the biggest in Canada. Um, but uh, outside of that, I really just only do like I don't do camp met anymore. So uh, I did that for 20 years and I kind of pulled back from that because it's, it's enough. You can let the other young priests get in there yeah. um, and volunteers. So now the only thing I do really is like I'm involved with the dance company, which also has people that I can delegate. I don't teach all the time only like uh, certain seasons and uh and that's what i don't do much else i do jujitsu a lot so uh so you know <laughs> i wasn't you know. sure if he was going to talk about the jujitsu this is like a talk about <laughs> someone who is passionate about so many things yet has the ability to pull it all together and make a true impact it within his community um one of the things i want to talk about father ted is is uh camp met camp met you guys is similar to um the one we have in new hampshire Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah talk, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So talk to us a little bit about what you saw, uh, how you saw this need to have the continuation of, or to help. Why did it start? That's what the question I'm trying to get at. So mm -hmm. what did you feel was lacking uh, within the community and how did this all come about? So and how did, what, and how did yeah. you stay involved for 20 years? Because that in and of itself is a commitment. Yeah, so so when it started, which is a very long time ago, 1998, it's, it's, I was only 16 when I was on the board. So it's kind of weird that I never actually was a camper, but I was I was already a counselor and also one of the founding members. So uh, when it started, it was really, um, it was actually a priest from the States, Father Michael Platanis, who was from Atlanta originally. Uh, and he was uh, serving up here uh, in Kitchener, Ontario, which is about an hour and a half outside of Toronto. Wonderful man with his Presbyterian Maria. And they were camp people. I think they had experience with, uh, especially in Greece, they, uh, there was experience with uh, Ionian Village. And they also mm -hmm. had uh, some experiences with um, camps in the States. And we never had a camp in Canada. Now, we're a little bit behind, like, as far as just, like, development and evolution of the Church of Canada compared to um, the Church in, in the States. Just because, you know, migration and things like that. And, you know, we're, like, 40 years behind where the Greeks are, I guess you could say, in the States, right? The Greeks are like third, fourth generation now. We're still first and second mm -hmm. in Canada, believe it or not. So um, there was a need because there was no camp program. And, um, and you know, camp is such an effective tool, even though it's limited. You only, you only get a week or two weeks with the kids. But, you know, it's a, it's a time to unplug. Back then, there were no cell phones and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> smartphones and things like that. So even now, it's even more of a need to unplug. But, you know, to go out into nature, be away from your parents, be a little more independent and, and spend time with like minded uh, kids, mostly Greek background. But of course, you have a lot of mixed families. Right. So you also have non-Greeks, uh, mm -hmm. but they're all Orthodox. And um, and of course, they even the non-Greek uh, children, they, they, they really enjoy the Greek culture and the Greek dancing and uh, and also like uh, other elements of Greek culture. Uh, philosophical elements you know the way we think the way we talk mm -hmm. the way we uh, approach life and, and lessons that are really important so this idea of being like a phil helene like a, an appreciator of the hellenic culture um and so that's how it kind of started and um and we were just involved i wasn't a priest then i was a lay person right so um you know we were kind of involved in that and started off really small and then it kind of grew and grew and grew um and then of course when i got ordained which was back in 2008 uh i left toronto and i went to winnipeg which was also running a local camp, but it was it was like their Greek camp, they called it, right? Mm. And so we rebranded it and brought it into the Camp Metamorphosis family. So it was part of, uh, you know, um, you know this kind of expanding uh, network. Uh, so then I ran Camp Met Winnipeg uh, location for uh, six years while I was there uh, and then came back. When I came back, I, I never ran Toronto's. Toronto was run by other priests. Like even now, Father Theologos Dracos, who is another local priest, mm -hmm. he is the camp director for for Canada and especially for the Toronto uh, location. I, I think the I think the camp is it, opinion on my part, but I, I think people will agree the camp is so important for all the reasons you listed. But if you're like a first generation Greek like I am, and I grew up going to Greece all the time, I don't really see that for my kids just because it's it's a lot more difficult for us to go to greece all the time like i did when i was little and i think the camp is like the closest thing you could get to to getting that community that cultural feel mm -hmm. of going to greece without going to greece i mean as close mm -hmm. as you could get i think and and that's why it's such an important thing for for our youth to, to have something like that and if I can add to what you just said, Ari, besides the trips to Greece, I think we grew up in that generation where there was a lot of other Greek families in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And as we, yeah. you know, in our generation, as we got older, got married, we moved out to different communities where there was less Greek yeah. presence. 
So having the camp as well is another added value of having um, interactions with other Greek kids or children yeah. that are not yeah. part of your local community. Yeah, and, and, and to add one more thing to that, when we were growing up, which was, okay, a late 80s or 90s, right? Um, people were much more connected to their local parish. And the local mm -hmm. parish, of course, had everything, like in the States, right? So you had, you had your Greek school, you had your Sunday school, but people were much more connected to their home parish, mm -hmm. right, quote unquote. Um, and unfortunately, I have found that now it's not it's not so it is more so in the States, I find, because I spent mm -hmm. some time in the States when I was studying uh, in New York. But like um, and so the American Greeks have more of a connection to their um, to their local parish still, mm -hmm. because Americans are very much like that. Right. Like they're very connected, which is a good thing. It's, um, you know, they're very connected to their local church, their local communities. Right. In Canada, for some reason, uh, I find in Toronto people have kind of dispersed. So we have a lot of churches, for example, and communities and, and Silogi in the GTA, which is the greater Toronto area, which has like almost 200,000 Greeks, a lot of Greeks. Uh, like there's 14 churches in the, in the greater Toronto area. That's a lot, just Greek Orthodox, yeah. right? But less and less people identify with the local parish. Yeah. People just church hop. Maybe they go for Memorial. The people are not connected. When I grew up at St. Nicholas, which was in Scarborough, which is mm -hmm. a suburb of Toronto. Um, I only went there. I only knew that growing up. I, I was part of the youth group and the dance group and the Sunday school and the, the altar boys and everything. My whole life was there. I never visited other churches. Um, we were completely connected locally to that one church, even though there was another church like 20 minutes on the street. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't exist. So you lose that cohesion of like this home family thing. Uh, do, you have, do you have any thoughts on why that is, especially since you compared it to the States? Uh, because in my, in my thinking, it's, it's less of a connection to the actual faith and more of like a social kind of like, oh, let's go see who's over here. Let's go try this church. And, you know, maybe the kids are fun. Do you think it's it's that kind of thing or do you think it's something else altogether? It's a good question. Um, I think uh, I think there's a negative effect of like general secularism on both the faith and the culture. So, you know, they go even though they're not the same, obviously, and we shouldn't confuse the two, yeah. um, they're intertwined, right? So this idea of like a connections to a local community where you put down roots and you volunteer, and this is both the cultural and the, and the religious, right? Mm -hmm. Cause, and so people are losing that. It could be, uh, I think I have some hypotheses about it, but I can't really prove it. It's like, you know, <laughs> smartphones, the internet, um, everybody is on this, these weird devices now. So it's like, um, there is less of a need to reach out and to kind of get together. Like for example, youth group, like we have a youth group here and I'm surprised. And I used to be the national youth director of Canada. Um, there's no youth groups left. Why? Mm -hmm. Not because people don't care. I mean, like it's not because the priests don't care or mm -hmm. the communities don't care. It's just youth don't care. They mm -hmm. don't. Why? Why would I physically go to like a church hall, for example, to sit down with other youth when I'm just talking with my friends on my smartphone all the time? It's right. not good because it's not a it's not a real connection like a you know uh, in real interpersonal skills. Um, I think you're one hundred percent right. I think so you hit it right on the head. head. As somebody who has been in this internet profession for twenty five years, I mean, I've seen pretty much everything. I see the trends. I see what has succeeded, what hasn't. And the one thing that we always say, whether we connected to the church or whether we just connected to our culture, we always would say over the years that there's no urgency of being together. There's no urgency. Like if you went to a, a Goya dance or, or a Greek dance in general, and you see like a, a girl that you like, or a, you, a girl sees a boy that she likes or whatever, they have to like kind of go back again to see if they can see them and talk to them. Now, like they'll just like direct message them. If you heard like a Greek song that you loved, you had no access to the song. You had to go to like a Greek night or like go to Greece. Yeah. And hear the song now. Oh, that's a cool song. Boom, boom, boom. There it is. And it's it's that disc. So the internet connects us all, but in reality, I really believe that it disconnects us in a lot of ways. And and to your point, uh, Father Ted, I I think you hit that right on the head. And like, what? I, this is a, a a very big question, but like, what? What can I you do? I like, subscribe to that know? hypothesis that Father Ted just mentioned because. We're seeing it with our children, with their with their friends, and with others. So yes, unfortunately, yeah.
And what so, can we do? What can we do? Uh, I was guys? just going to say, what do we do? So what do, we all have children that are in that similar age, you know, age range, if you will. So how do we, I, you know, I, Father Ted, like you, I grew up in the church. I went, you know, it's a Greek school, Sunday school, played basketball. My dad was on the parish board. I mean, we lit, our life was literally that church. I was in that church probably more than I was anywhere else, just because mm -hmm. all of my activities were around that church. So on a weekly basis, if you allotted time, most of my time was spent in that building. Now. Sure. My daughter, sure, you know, she goes to Greek school, but her Greek school isn't in the church. Yes, we go to church. We don't go like every week as we should, but, you know, I, she has no connection to I, the building fine uh, or the pe more so what that building represents, right? So as a parent, uh, how do we, how do we, how do we get more people out to want to be part of our Hellenic you know, Hellenic culture, Hellenic uh, being, if you will, and help preserve this. The whole point of why we're here and why we're doing this is we all want to make sure that when our kids, kids are here, you know, there's something Greek for them, mm -hmm. right? At the end of yeah. the day, we don't, we're all first generation. We don't want it to drop with just us. So what other than, or is there a way to use technology to our advantage? I'm just throwing this out there mm -hmm. to be able to bring people, you know, together again. I don't know. So, yeah. So this is a big question and yeah. I'll try to give the fastest kind of <laughs> answer. Uh, it's complex, but, um, and it's interesting that as like, as a priest, for example, like this question, it applies to both our culture and the faith. And what do I mean by that is that we're finding over the years that like we spent all this time both from the religious point of view and also from the cultural point of view thinking that if we could just get the best types of programs that it would fix everything right so if you think of the last 50 years right mm -hmm. it's always programs 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 like what kind mm -hmm. of programs can we craft for different age groups and in the states they put a lot of money and time into this even more so than canada um and what what have we found we found that it's not about programs believe it or not it's it's more about an encounter. And what do I mean by encounter? Like, like people crave like an experience mm -hmm. and some type of like deep connection. And that is both on the religious uh, level and, and on the cultural level. Right. So um, that's, so youth groups, you know, dance groups, all this kind of stuff. A lot of them have died. They're gone. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they're gone is that um, it's the way we approach it. So if you're just going to have a program for the sake of having a program, because you want to get people to come to that program and teach them or convey certain information, right? Whatever that is, whether it's religious or cultural, it ain't going to work anymore because mm -hmm. people kind of don't really respond to that. Um, like look at the dance groups for, I'll give an example of dance groups because that's the world that mm -hmm. you know, I'm involved in. Right. Uh, but obviously was started, you know, 20 years ago. That's a long time ago where there are a lot of silogi and every silogo, which is like, you know, the cultural organization, the non-religious cultural organization in, in Toronto, they existed. Every choreo had a silogo and almost all of them had dance groups, right? Mm -hmm. uh, plus the big ones, you know, the big, the church dance groups, silogi dance groups, um, other big organization dance groups, Greek community of Toronto, all these kind of groups, right? And it, and over the last 20 years, like, it's interesting that, okay, my dance group's kind of been, um, we, we've gone through ups and downs, but it's been pretty sta um, stable, thank God. Uh, but I've noticed that like almost all the Siloy have shut down or they've lost their dance groups. So that doesn't exist anymore. So like we have a dramatic drop. I would say an 80% drop, maybe more of like in the last 20 years of like loss of dance groups. They mm -hmm. don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, only a few survived uh, over the last two decades. Uh, and the ones that did survive are the ones who tend to have a really good culture around them. Mm -hmm. Like the ones that like, you know, it's a community, right? It's not just come and learn dance or come, it's more like people who are really passionate, and so they're going to get together with other people, and yes, they're going to learn dancing, but they're going to do other things together, and they're going to sing together, and they're going to learn about their, their history together, and they're going to take trips together, right? So it becomes a tribe, right? And that's different than just, I take my kid mm -hmm. to this particular dance group on this particular time, right? So th th there needs to be like an encounter, and I find that the groups that do that well are the ones that survive, and the ones that don't do that well, um, they don't survive, right? Uh, it's the same thing with the church, right? If there's not like a personal encounter and you don't feel a connection to your community mm -hmm. and you don't look up to people um, and you don't have an encounter with your faith, then then there's no there's no reason to be there. It becomes a cultural, you know, relic, I guess you could say, right? 
Um, so that's kind of like even the, the, the Greek schools too. Like the Greek school, my Greek school was part of my community, right? So I had all my friends mm -hmm. went to the same Greek school, the St. Nicholas Greek school, and all my friends, the same kids were also in the dance group, and the same kids were in the Sunday school, and the same kids were in the in, in the in the what's it called uh, in the altar boys, right? Mm -hmm, so it was yeah. the same parea, and we were just doing all these things together, right? Where now things are disjointed. It's like I go over here for my Greek dancing, I go over here for my Greek school. It's all different people. I don't really know them very well, right? Yeah. So it's it's connections with people, I think, more so than having really effective programs, which don't always work. As as somebody who's been within the Greek community and actively working for the Greek community for for so long, I one hundred percent agree with what you're saying because I, there's evidence. Like we we've seen it. We've seen exactly what you're saying. Programs here, programs here. What can we do? What can we do? Program, program, program. Okay, that's nice, but it's like it's not really getting to the heart of that problem of of our disconnection and experience. I mean. When I say I grew up going to Greece every summer, what was that? In essence, that's an experience, and that's what connected me. So, no. yeah, 100%, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I went to Greece every summer, right? Not, okay, almost every summer. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> sometimes we, but I went a lot when I was a kid. And back then, school summer was longer because mm -hmm. I remember school ended mid-June, not the end of June. So we got an mm -hmm. extra two weeks, I think, back when I was a kid. And uh, so it was two and a half months in Greece because we have a house in Athens, and we were there. And so um, that did more. I went to Greek school. And of course, the Greek school taught me a lot. But the only reason why I'm fluent mm -hmm. uh, and, and, I, and my Greek is I can read and write and I can speak. And, you know, obviously I'm a priest and I'm involved and, and I use it. But all my friends who went through Greek school, the same Greek school, they don't really speak Greek anymore. Mm -hmm. And they had the same education as I did. Mm -hmm. And they grew up in the same environment, except the ones who were going to Greece. They were immersing themselves. It was it, for me, it was the encounter with Greece and going to the villages. And that's where I, I had a love for dance. And um, like, of course, the programs back home, like here, they reinforced that love and they, they nurtured it. But th that kind of encounter was because I had experiences in Greece. I had experiences with family. I had experiences like actually going to local villages and, you know, seeing the culture and the dancing and the music, all that kind of stuff. If you don't do that. It's very hard for kids to uh, have a love for it if they're not immersed in it. Um, it's very, very difficult. 100% agree. 100% agree. So you know, I, I just, I, I want to just take like a quick minute. Can you, because this is my own personal curiosity, but I'm sure uh, the audience wants to know, what what is it and at what point in your life did you know that uh, becoming a priest was your calling? Like, was there an epiphany one day or was it just a slow kind of attraction towards it what 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 at what point did you know this is this is the life i want so no epiphany <laughs> it's more <laughs> of a boring story um well not boring it's just everyone expects like a time where somebody just kind of makes a decision and of yeah. course you have to make a decision at some point to go to seminary and i did that of course in grade 12 when i was you know graduating high school and i had to decide where i was going to go to school mm -hmm. um but so right out of high school, I went straight into seminary, but it was more like, you know, it was more like a gradual just realization. You know, I was always involved. I always loved it. As I got older, I got more serious. You know, you uh, at some point, your faith has to become yours, and not your parents, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. a lot of people don't make that transition. Yeah. Uh, and so at some point, I had to start kind of taking responsibility for myself and what I believed and not just doing what my parents told me to do. Uh and it, be, it became more of just like a natural, I gravitated towards that. And that was like the normal thing for me to do because I loved it so much. Just like somebody, you know, they, some people are artists and some people are, are, are electricians and some people mm -hmm. are something else like, and they gravitate towards that naturally because they're, it's their natural gifts. Right. So that's what I gravitated towards. And um, so it wasn't just like a one day I woke up and I suddenly had an epiphany, but it was just a natural thing that I wanted to do. So it was much longer. It was like a longer formation. Right. And and seeing your history and everything you're involved with, and now sitting here speaking to you, uh, I I get a sense that you have like a, a skill and a talent for leadership because you know your local priest has to be a good leader. I mean, you're 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 the shepherd of the flock, right? So I, I see that you know, in speaking to you, like I get that essence. I don't I don't know you, but I I really feel that. So it's great that somebody who has your your skill set, your mindset, your personality, and then connecting 
uh, with your faith and, and going in that direction to lead others uh, is, is awesome. I, as a Greek, I, I love to see it. I love to hear it. I love to like experience it. So, so basically we, we basically need more Father Ted's is what you're oh, saying. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. That's we it. do. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's a bad thing. That would be a bad thing. We need, we need more of everybody. We need yeah. more of every, everybody has different skills and yeah. different charisma, right? Like different right. charisma and, and gifts. And um, we, that's, you know, that's the beauty of the church, right? It's, it's a body. So, you know, you, not everybody can be a finger. Not everybody can be a foot. You need all of it. Not everybody I'm, can be I'm a not gonna say I'm not going to say which part Fati is, but we'll move past <laughs> that. And, well, uh... <laughs> Father Ted, uh, what you just, part's important. What you, what you just mentioned. I, I love the diplomacy. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, no, what, no, it's true. What just mentioned is uh, if, if you listen to our you know, our friends and family about, you know, the complaining about, you know, what's happened to our culture. And I say, why don't you reflect? Because even I think within ourselves, you make have to make a commitment, mm -hmm. you know, and putting in the time and the sacrifice. We talk about this with Ari and Rula is that our parents uh, made tons of sacrifices. We had to make decisions. Do I take my child to soccer practice or do I enroll them into Greek school? Do I go to the Sunday uh, the mall or do I go to church with them? So the, the fact that we say they were so busy, 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 everyone's super, super busy, but we have all this technology to help us minimize the time that's needed. What happens to the fact that now we free up a lot of time that we can allocate it to the things that are important, which is our faith and our culture. So I think we're a little hypocritical as, as, as socially as a society about, you know, we're seeing the downfall and we're seeing less enrollment, less attendance, but I think we are also within ourselves the issue. 100 percent you're preaching the mm -hmm. choir here like um obviously <laughs> priests um, it's not good for us to harp on things because that's not useful but um but it's true though it's like it, it's it, we either like to harp on, on on leadership right the leadership is bad whatever like to make fun of that or the leadership likes to harp on on the followers right or on the parishioners or on the members whatever whether it be a silo or a church or whatever and in the end it's it's all about the individual uh, in the sense that it starts with the individual and then it affects the community, right? So every human being, doesn't matter whether you're the head or you're the foot, whatever. If all parts are not healthy and they're not contributing, then every, there's a breakdown, right? So you can have a great priest, for example, in a community. Like I, I've been blessed. I've been, you know, I've been blessed that I happen to be in this is my third community and I, I happen to have good boards, good people to work with. So to a certain degree, I don't believe in luck, so I don't say I'm lucky, mm -hmm. but um, I happened to be in communities where people worked with me. I didn't have pushback. Mm -hmm. So I was able to do things, right? But that wasn't me. It was also like, I, you know, there's a head, but I had healthy feet, healthy hands, right? Healthy everything, right? But I have priest friends who are wonderful people and really good and, and charismatic and, and have a lot of skills, more skills than myself, but they happen to be placed in communities where they were unhealthy, and they had people working against them and people were not interested in the greater good of the community. They were more interested in other things. And so they had horrible times in ministry uh, and they tried to do things for the youth. They tried to do things for, for a lot of different stuff and nothing took off. And then people, the, the perception is, is that, oh, the priest is more successful here. He's not successful there, but it's not. It's, it's everybody has to take responsibility for themselves. If you're a parent, you take responsibility for your children. If you're a child, you take responsibility for yourself and to be obedient to your parents and to to kind of like trust their guidance. If you're a grandparent, same thing. If you're on a board, if you're running a podcast, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Everybody has to give their best. And that's the only way a community gets better. If one group is not, you're going to have, it's just like, you know, you know, if, you know if, if, if you stub your toe, right, it's a tiny little toe, but it hurts and it distracts you from everything else. You're like limping around, right? Uh, and it stops you from running, stops you from walking it stops you from moving around right same thing with your hand right i cut my finger the other day a little tiny cut and i couldn't like grip in jujitsu i couldn't <laughs> do i couldn't i had to like wrap that up it was just like i'm like this is this tiny little thing and um and look how much it's affecting my efficiency and like what i'm supposed to be doing in my life right so i think everybody has to take responsibility for themselves first and not throw it on anybody else and then it's like what jordan peterson says you know make your bed <laughs> make your bed first don't worry about everybody else right so That's right it, yeah. it, I, I I so much uh, like love hearing this from especially from a priest because it, you seem to be spot on you know maybe it's because 
uh, you know, you grew up kind of similarly to us and, uh, you know, but it's just spot on uh, the problems, the, the, the goods, the bad, you know, you, you really have your, your kind of finger on the pulse. Um, so, I mean, what, what, what's the future hold? I mean, what, what do you see? What do you right. see coming? Is it, are we just so, you know, first generation hat, they didn't know anything about America. They were scared. So they all huddled together, the Greeks. And is that why we had such a strong culture and now we're getting assimilated and we're losing it? I mean, is there anything that could stop the assimilation of Greeks into American or Canadian culture? Uh, like, it, it seems like there, there's certain things that we know could work, but in reality, is is it possible? I mean, we are, we came, our parents came to another country. And so obviously, as time goes on, we're going to kind of adapt to that, you know, the, the country that we're in and, and the, the culture of that country. So how difficult is it in reality to say that we can keep this going? I pray and hope to God we can. Um, it's just like, but you know, all these things that we're talking about are, are so true. It's like, the more we become assimilated, the, the, the more difficult it is to keep that kind of vibe going. And, you know, I, I think with your speaking of experiences and your understanding of what attracts the youth, I, I think that's our best bet. If anybody else uh, disagrees or agrees. Yeah, I, 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 if I can chime in quickly, yes, I think that we have to understand and embrace that we're living in different times. So we have to kind of understand that maybe our approaches have to be different. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we have to uh, figure out ways of, like you just mentioned, attracting the youth. Uh, what used to attract them before might not work today. So understanding that is where we got to build our game plan around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't want to be politically incorrect, <laughs> but I, I, I don't think there is a politically correct answer to this. Uh, why? Um, because just statistically speaking, not to be bleak, um, the more multicultural you are, which is not a bad thing in the sense of being multicultural, like Canada is even more than the States, right? Mm -hmm. um, to its detriment, I think, for the, for the actual cultural communities. Um, the more multicultural you are, the less you will be what your, you know, your respective culture is, right? So, and this is just, you can't stop it. Uh, the only thing you can stop is, and, and the, the, the politically incorrect thing to say is that, well, if you look at the cultures that maintain their culture, right? Maintain the language, especially maintain their traditions. They're usually insular cultures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're the ones who marry amongst themselves. Um, they speak their language at home. They, they, they eat their food, they do all these things. And now th these, these kind of things are considered to be backwards in Canadian culture, especially, uh, and in American culture, generally speaking, right? This kind of melting pot, right? So um, the more, and, and I'm not saying like, I'm not advocating for not, you know, mixing and things like that. I'm not saying what I'm yeah, saying, yeah. but I'm just saying that, that you can't have everything. Yeah. You can't have everything, right? So if we, in Canada, we are 80% mixed marriage, 90 almost. Right. Um, at this church, almost 100 percent mixed marriage. Wow. Right. So that means that you can have wonderful families, of course, and, and, and you know, and mixed heritage. But the moment that happens, yeah. you have to understand and accept that you're probably going to lose the language within one generation. Yeah. You're probably going to lose like half your traditions because at home, you're not going to speak like if a Greek marries an Italian, for example, which is fine um, already you're going to have in order to to have a, a kind of a happy uh productive family both sides are going to water down right. and that's just that's like just right you know sociology like that's just the way it is right um <laughs> or there's going to be war right so in, in order to not have war both religious war in the family uh and cultural war and linguistic war um, basically the two sides are going to meet somewhere in the middle where they can kind of have a common ground and have love and compassion and like that. They'll still be, they'll still express themselves, but what are the kids going to be? The kids are going to be a little bit of both, which can be a little less of both as well. Right. And then so on and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I'm not trying to be negative about it. It's just, um, you can't have everything. And so the best we can do is to, um, again, uh, try to educate ourselves in my opinion, try to express um like the beauty of our culture without being overbearing 
uh, so that you, 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 you know, you kind of preach by attraction, not by, uh, you know, force. Uh, and you try to like offer people, um, you know, the beauty of that so that they will be attracted to it and they will want to learn more about it and, and, and engage in it. Right. So it's possible because like, for example, my, my dance company, it's like, we have a lot of passion. And so we try to impart to our dancers and we have a lot of dancers who are mixed background. A lot of kids, most of the kids are mixed background, but they come and they learn and they, they, they sing Greek songs and they play instruments and they dance. Right. So they have a passion and I'm sure they also have a passion for the other side of the family. Right. Um, but inevitably, <laughs> Mm. Well, this you know, a, the, the difficult silver, problem, <laughs> the silver lining that I'll just throw in on that, because you're right. You're 100 percent right on everything you said. And if you really think about it, it's it's kind of bleak. But the silver lining is that when you have two cultures, I'm always going to put my money that the dominant culture is the Greek. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. So hopefully, Sometimes. Hopefully, Sometimes. Yeah, hopefully that could like kind of like. Even if it's Sometimes. a lot of like mixed backgrounds, I mean, there's so much that our culture offers and such beauty and such, uh, you know, traditions that hopefully that could kind of be part of that experience that draws the youth, hopefully, you know. When you know, when you know your culture. Right. That's All right well, yes, good point. Very. So good. it comes back to the individual we were talking about before, right? So if the individual knows their faith and their culture, mm -hmm. then they, it's not a battle, but rather it's like, you advocate for your culture and you also advocate for your faith because you know, but when you don't know, uh, you will almost always get subsumed mm -hmm. or you will get tracked. Uh, we say this like for priests, we talk about this all the time, right? Like religiously speaking, right? So, you know, that, that if somebody is like strong Orthodox Christian, right. And they're, they're very involved in their faith and their culture, then even if they have like a mixed marriage, you know, like they're going to have, you know, they're going to advocate for themselves. They're going to make sure that, that, you know, that part is, is part of the family. Right. But a person who's kind of nominal Christian doesn't really go or whatever, maybe Christmas and Easter or whatever. Mm -hmm. If they marry somebody who is stronger, let's say a Catholic or a Protestant, or whatever, almost always okay. they will drift away yeah. to the side that is that is more fervent and more has more zeal for their side. Right. And it, just because they don't know and also because they want to make peace. Right. So, again, I'm not trying to set it up like an adversarial kind of thing but this is just the reality of what happens right and and so it's so important for us to kind of enrich ourselves and our children and like to know what we believe what we what we are as or as christians and as or as as greeks right especially uh to know these things and to to know why too and not just to do things because if you don't understand like you won't you won't keep it up so i think i think some of the lessons we learned here today are educate yeah have have a positive and you know exciting uh, uh feel for your culture and uh you know yank those phones out of their hands every once in a while and um just... hey, individual accountability is what i got out of this a lot of it is you know the line that stuck with me is your faith has to become your own not your parents that to me i literally yeah. wrote it down i mean because for me that happened um but i think as individuals we need to say it's okay that we are doing these things. I mean, my husband knew, like that was the thing for me. It was a non-negotiable, I was marrying a Greek over and out because my kids were going to Greek school. We were going to church. We were going to be raised Greek Orthodox. So I had that, whether I married a Greek or not, which I, I had a feeling I would, I was going to be the more dominant person and they were doing my stuff anyway. Um, so why not make that uh, easier, and you know, marry, uh, marry yes, of Greek, yeah. right? Um, and the irony is uh, all of us have married uh, Greeks on here. That's the irony of it all. Um, mm -hmm. But regardless, you know, as my daughter is, uh, she's, she'll be, she's nine and a half, almost 10. You know, I want to make sure that I'm instilling in her you know, that ability for her to make her own decisions around her faith. And as of yet, I, I haven't been doing a good job about that. Like, that's what I learned uh, after talking to you today. And there's an opportunity because that these traditions and cultures can carry on um, if we, our generation, takes that individual accountability on says, and says, this is important. That's it. This is important. We're going to keep doing it. Um, and that's a choice we all have, whether, as Swati had said earlier, you know, we go to soccer or we go to Greek school. We go to the mall or we go to church, right? Yeah. Um, and it's up to us. It's up to us who are bringing up these children to sort of keep that going. Yeah. What a power. What power of this generation. I mean, honestly, what a powerful moment in our our, our traditions and our religion and, and culture we are where we kind of are at that point of what are we going to do with it? Are we yeah. going to help it go here or, or not, right? 
Yeah. Well, so anyway, so. this has been Father Ted. Uh, for me, th this has been amazing, guys. What do you think? The, uh, we've interviewed a uh, <laughs> thousand people, and the the most. The, like the one guy who could represent what I feel about a lot of things in just this brief conversation is Father Ted. Thank you, Father Ted. I mean, I, I, I feel better about our culture when I know there's people like you that are that are leading, mm -hmm. you know, a certain charge. So thank you for that. And if I can add, Father Ted, I, I we don't want this to be the last time that we have you on our podcast because i think we can bring you back and we can discuss more subjects uh in more detail i think, I think father ted said he wants to fight you uh for <laughs> charity or something so Fati, get ready to get your oh do you, uh, you do uh, you do martial arts not at all <laughs> not that's what will be fun about this father ted <laughs> i verbally <Yeah>. <laughs> well you know, father so... ted again uh, we we appreciate so much taking the time. We, you're involved in so many things that we also appreciate, and and thank you so much for taking that time with us. Thank you, like seriously, thank you for what you do because, you know, the three of us here, we truly, truly believe in everything that we preach. We truly believe in our Greek culture. We truly love it, and it's individuals as you, such as yourself that really uh, make us you know, realize like, yes, they, we, we need to, you know, maybe there's a, a, a certain timeline. And after that, who knows, but until we reach that point, there's so much we can do. There's so much accountability that we could take. And, you know, with people like yourself, it makes it that much easier and it keeps us inspired. So again, we, we appreciate it and we thank you for being with us. I uh, appreciate it. Um, thank you for having me. It's been, it's been fun. Uh, anytime you guys ever need anything, uh, I'm always here. Uh, can I do a plug? Absolutely. <laughs> of course. So, so uh, yeah, so like this is more, it's, it's cultural. Under the, just so I have a YouTube channel, Father Ted Talks. <laughs> it's a ripoff of the Ted Talks. We just put the <laughs> FR in front of it. Um, but it's, uh, so I do a lot of practical stuff on there. Like it's, it's mostly religious, but also there's cultural elements as well. And, you know, just a lot of practical orthodoxy, like how do we live and why do we do the things that we do? Uh, so um, check that out if you want. And I also have a podcast, uh, The Fighting Priests, which is actually, um, you know, Orthodox and Jiu Jitsu. So that's a little bit of a different niche altogether. But if anybody's interested in uh, exploring kind of like uh, how we as Orthodox, um, you know, and Greeks, um, you know, how, how we kind of engage with like more secular things, right? Like, like the martial arts world and other things where um, sometimes we don't see how those things connect, but they do. So um, yeah, check that out if you want. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. That's that. That's actually like really cool. So I'm 100 percent going to check that out because I need to see how all this comes together. <laughs> but also, we will have all the links, all the information um, on Father Ted. We'll have in our show notes and the video notes. And one more time, Father Ted, thank you so much. We appreciate it very much, more than than you could probably understand. Uh, Foti Rula, thank you guys. Everybody out there, thank yeah. you for watching and listening. Um, please uh, listen to the words that Father Ted has spoken today. Check out his uh, his his channels, his his sites, everything, and and you know, take a little bit of accountability. Do what you can because there is a limited timeline, and we have to make the most of it and extend it as much as we can. So everybody out there, thank you for watching and listening. Thanks everyone, and we will see you next time. Bless us. Thank you guys.